we're in a series called Why? And today we'll answer this question, why can't I do whatever I want? We are answering the questions that some of us might have. And uh, uh, this is the question we're going to ans- answer today. Why can't I uh, do whatever I-, I want? And the passage that we'll speak from, uh, we'll study from is Galatians chapter 5. Verses 14 to 23. Uh, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions and divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, or things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Amen. Uh, In this generation where uh, happiness is idolatrous, you know, becomes an idol in our lives, Uh, we want to follow our dreams. It's really, uh, if you interpret it in in our way, through a biblical way, is that we are seeking for our pleasure. We are seeking for uh, the fulfillment of our desires. We're seeking for happiness. We want to fulfill our dreams. And often, nothing wrong with that because there could be good desires, good Uh, you know, dreams that we have. But uh, I'm sure one time or another you have said this uh, this sentence, why can't I do whatever I want? That might have been when you were six to your parents. That might have been, uh, you know, when you couldn't get into school uh, that you wanted to get into. uh, So you get into better school, right, here at the University of Illinois. Uh, Or that person did not like you uh, and, you know, uh, you, you couldn't date or you couldn't have a relationship with someone you wanted. And you might say that frequently in your life. Uh, just any human being who should, would say this. Why can't I do whatever I want? Uh, I remember reading a philosopher that said, that talked about how one day, just one day, he can be somewhere that no one knew him and do whatever he wanted. Whatever he wanted for just one day. And we probably have those kinds of dreams in our lives or desires in our lives. In fact, uh, when you dream, sometimes that w- that's what happens in your dream. So, you know, we would like to answer this question. How harmful this could be when, uh, if you were to do whatever you want. So, here's a, we're going to answer five ways. Why can't I do whatever I want? Five things. First of all, because we have conflicting desires. Secondly, because we are created beings. Thirdly, because it will hurt us. Fourthly, fourthly, because it will hurt other people. And fifthly, because there are eternal consequences to our choices that we have. So we'll talk about these five things so that we can be motivated uh, to uh, choose the right things, to choose the right fulfillment, right pleasure in our lives. So first of all, because we are conflicting, why can't I do whatever I want? Because secondly, not secondly, first, because we have conflicting desires. Because simply it is impossible to do whatever we want because of conflicting desires. That's what Galatians 5.17 says. It's talking about different kinds of desires, all kinds of desires that we have. And then then he says these are opposed to each other. There, there, There are desires... It's not a desire, but there are different kinds of desires in our hearts. 
and often they oppose each other. This passage seems to point that we have more than one desire operating at a given moment. And often they are not in alignment. They are often in conflict with each other. Uh, Because we are pleasure seekers. Being a human being means in another way to describe a human being is we are seeking for fulfillment of desires. We are seeking for pleasure, maximum pleasure or minimum pain. Minimum pain still is in alignment with maximum pleasure. That's what human being means. That's what being alive means. That's the, one of the essence of human being. But also we have many desires at one moment. Think about right now. What do you want right now? You want to breathe. <laughs> you want to breathe. Just don't breathe for a couple minutes. You would want to breathe. You, you want to breathe. Uh, Some of you want to have better grades. Some of you want to eat right now. Some of you want the sermon to end quickly and, you know, go eat. And some of you want, again, like somebody to like you or somebody to dislike you. Stop, you know, kind of thing. Uh, (laughs) Some of you are not laughing. Uh, (laughs) So basically, at at every moment, we we have so many desires, right, of They could could be in alignment, but also sometimes they're in conflict with one another. And at that moment, you can't have both. What do you want right now? We can't have everything that we want. Thus, it it is impossible to uh, do whatever we want. We often need to choose between several conflicting things we want. Therefore, we need wisdom in life right, for our choices. So... Be close to not good-looking people, but wise people, right, according to the Bible. Uh, Especially when you need help. Uh, This means there has to be sort of guidance to our choices and pleasure in our lives. The question is, what should limit or guide our choices and right kind of pleasures in our lives? Because we all deny some desires in our lives. Uh, We always have to choose between our choices and our desires. So wisdom is needed. We must live because we must live for highest and lasting pleasure uh, in this life or according to the Bible in eternity. Often at cost of temporary uh, pleasure. You need to choose temporary displeasure so that you can have longer and eternal and better, uh, you know, pleasure that we are seeking in our lives. Temporary pain and hardship must be chosen for eternal pleasure. You have to go through pain of studying so that you can have, uh, you know, pleasure being rich, right? Uh, so you can do whatever you want. So that, that kind of thing. Now, uh, I, I showed you a long time ago if, this illustration, but it's different. Now, this Toilet, toilet paper. This is a toilet, one piece of toilet paper. Now, if you see this, nobody's going to jump <laughs> like this thousand dollars or something. Like jump and try to get it, right? <laughs> Everybody will pass by. If, even if you have it, you'll probably throw it away, right? It's not that important. However, this could be very important. If you are in Africa, like some of our missions team, in African bathrooms, they don't have anything. You only have your hands. It's a choice between your hand and this. And if this is the only thing that you have at that moment, at certain moments, certain situations, given context, this becomes incredibly important commodity. Now, if you have roll of toilet paper, that's, you know, this is not as important, but still, if this is the only thing you have, you have to think. You have to be efficient. You have to think about how to utilize the resource that you have, right? And I, you know, there's, there, there's a best way to do this because it has to be strong enough yet <laughs> <laughs> enough, right? Uh, anyway, I, you know, figured it out through many trial and errors uh, in my life. But one is important if this is all you have in a given context, right? Uh, if this... This is all you have, right? 
if this is if this is one hour that you have, let's say if this is symbolic of one hour that you have, what you choose in the hour is important, right? Your choice. You can do so many things, but if all one hour is all you have, then what you do in that hour, you, you hour you make cho- you have to make choices. If this represents one day, right? And if that's all you have, uh, you know what you do in that day is important. So you have to schedule things. Right? You have to place things. And if that na- day n- is never going to come back, and that's all you have, you got to plan. You got to do time management, and that's what we teach at CFC. If if this is if, if this represents one year. And your choice you made last year if you're a freshman or a graduate student, that new transfer student, whatever you, it came, the choice that you made last year is, is important because that's going to determine all the things you do in that one year or two years, three years, four years, five years, eight years that you have. Uh, the Bible says you have one life to live. Right? So what you do is important in your life, we always have to choose what is best. Always choose, have to choose what is best. It's always true, right? Uh, in, our, in your daily schedule, you have so many things to do, you have to schedule things, important things first, wise things, doing important things first, and do the rest. And if you can't finish the least important thing, that's still better than do the least important things and not be able to do the best things or most important thing that you need to do. When you have to choose what movies to watch, you, for two hours, you got two hours, and you're choosing between the movies, you can only choose one. And your choice is important because you're sitting there either enjoying or you're bitter, sitting there being bitter. Right? So our choices are important uh, because we have conflicting desires, and out of all the desires that we have, we need to choose what is best. In, in one sense, as a human being, choose what would be maximum pleasure most pleasure and most lasting pleasure in our lives. That's why we can't do whatever we want because we have conflicting desires and our choices matter. The next next question is how can we choose what is best for us in eternity? Key is we have to realize that we are created beings. We're not creators, which leads to the second point, which is we can't do whatever we want because we are created beings. We are created beings. That means we are under the creator. Another way to describe that is we are under the law that he made. So Galatians 5.18, it says, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, this law, of course, is talking about the law of God, the Bible. But actually, if you say law in the Bible, there are two kinds of laws, right? There are there could be different kinds of laws. Well, let's talk about two kinds of laws. One is law of nature. The other one is law of God in the Bible as created beings. We are under the law of nature, and also we are under the law of God in the Bible. And let's talk about both things here. First is because we, because we are not God, we are created beings. We have limitations because we, have, we are under the natural law that God has implanted in this world. That means there are desires we are not allowed to fulfill in our lives. Often we desire what is outside of our limitations. If God made you as a fish, you can't live outside the fish. Outside of of water. I think, yeah. (laughs) A fish has to live inside the water, yet you can freely live in the ocean, inside the water. There's so much freedom, but there's limitation because you're a created being. Uh, even if you have a lot of power, like if you're a Batman, you can't be like a Superman, right? <laughs> Batman, you know, and you want to fly, you're going to die, even if you're a Batman. I don't know why you're a Batman, Batman, but you can't fly. Right? But Batman can't fly, so if Batman tries to fly, he's going to die. So it's, it's like that. It is incredible. It is blessing for us to freely live in the in the contentment of our limitations as a creative beings. It is incredible blessing to be able to freely live, and there's so much freedom. Freely, it is blessing for us to f- live freely in contentment of our limitation. 
But then question is, why didn't he create us to be like God, to be God? Simple question is because he can't. <laughs> okay? Well, God, there's only, uh, you know, God can, uh, only God can be God. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Only God can be God. He is a being that cannot be created. He, he can only exist. God can only exist. God cannot be created. God, is, God can only create. So when there was nothing, there was God. So human being, even if he tries to, tries to create God, he can't. Because only God, uh, can, God can only exist. Not can, he cannot be created. So he did the next best thing, in fact. So he created us as close to him as possible. Better and above any other created beings or created things or created beings. He made us in such a way we can, even though we cannot be him, we can still grow to be more and more and more. Remember, he's infinite, so he can only create us in such a way we can be more and more like him, even to represent him. Uh, then how can we grow? So it'll take whole eternity for us to become like him. And he made us that way that we can grow to be like him. And how can we grow and how can we represent him? And the key is the law of God. We, talked, we just talked about natural law as created beings, but the key is the law of God. Through the law of God, we can go closer to become like God. So we just talked about uh, the things that we cannot do because we are created beings. But in other sense, there are things we can do because we are created, created for something, which is what written law is about. So even though, second sub-point to this is, even though we are not God, uh, therefore we have limitation, but also he created us to desire to image him. That's what written law is about. That means there are desires that we are allowed to fulfill. We are allowed to be fulfilled. We can be freely fulfilled to receive pleasure. That means there's purpose to our, even our limitation, and purpose to uh, our, uh, him, uh, him allowing us to be as created beings. In order for us to understand that, we need to understand the desires of our heart. What is heart? It's the essence of who we are. It's the core part of how He created us. The heart operates to image Him. It's the heart that helps us to image God, to become like Him and grow in Him. And how heart operates is through desires. Now, what is desire? So we have, we, we have hearts and we have desires. We have heart, we have desires. What is desire of our heart? It's what heart does. For example, when we say heart, essence of our being, we're, that's still meta, metaphorical sense, right? It's, uh, it's, heart is a physical thing. So when you think about physical heart, what does it do? One of the things it does is pumps blood. Pumping blood is not the heart, but what heart does. Desire is not the heart, but what heart does. Lung, same thing. What does lung do? Breathe. Lung helps us to breathe, right? So breathing is not the lung, but what the lung does. So heart desires. Heart expresses itself through desires. And Jonathan Edwards, famous theologian, said this, in the essence of our heart, and we have desires, and we always desire for highest pleasure at that moment. So we are that kind of beings. So what is common factor in all of our choices as we desire things? I want to do whatever I want. What, what is common factor in all of our choices? We always choose for highest pleasure at that moment. Minimum pain or maximum pleasure. Highest pleasure or minimum pain. So when Galatians 5.18, it says, but if you are under, uh, led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. When it says you are not under the law, right, it does not mean that you have no relationship with the law, but it re really means we are not under the condemnation of the law. That's why a few verses before it said, it said this, the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Meaning, if we 
become who He desires us to be. In fact, all the law is telling us to love, love, love. And if we have a heart that desires Him and desire to live according to His law, we are loving others and we are loving God. We are fulfilling the law. That's what all the laws are. Laws in the Bible are pointing towards so that we can become like Jesus. We can grow to be more and more like our God. We can love, love God and love others. We can image Him. We can represent Him. So law guides us to image Him. If we take the law of God with our spiritual nature, He made us. Think about a house. You, go, you borrow a house and you mess up, mess things up. A- Airbnb, you mess up, mess up, you got to pay for it. It's not your house. You rent a car, you do whatever you want, you destroy it. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. We are of God. He created us. So uh, we need to live according to His desire, which is what law says, and that leads to our pleasure, greatest pleasure. Though we are limited, there's limitation, no aspect to our being cre- us being created, but yes aspect gives us the maximum, greatest, eternal pleasure that comes from Him. In fact, our limitation can be used. Each and every one of us, in our limitedness and our distinction our, uh, and our differentness, still image Him, small part of Him. Our limitations are due to Him creating us, but if we overcome we can overcome this individual limitation with our togetherness because we are not to image him alone, picture him alone. We are limited, but each and every one of us differently limited in such a way that his intention is our uniqueness, that together we can image him. Better way, greater way, more. Each and every one of us together show who God is. That's why we need more people in the church of Jesus Christ. More, one more person, each and every one of you. Important, differently important in such a way. Together, we can beautifully, we can show His uh, beauty, we can show His greatness. Our limitation is inevitable, but purposefully used through our uniqueness to display vast and infinite beauty of God together. Uh, If we live according to His law. His law guides us to that. I talk about this illustration often in marriage when two people get married. Each and every one of us are like, like, is like instrument, like an instrument, right? Let's say you're a piano, you're a flute, guy like guy over there might be tuba or something like that. You know, different instruments. We all are like different instruments. We are limited. A tuba cannot make the sound of flute. Flute cannot make sound of piano. But we all are like different instruments. We play different instruments. But thing is, even though we are limited and we can only make our sound, but you put those sounds together, it becomes beautiful music. Ooh, ooh, you know, like, you know, together. Wow, ooh, itself doesn't sound. What is that? But when it supports, ooh, wow, right? Beautiful music. And when we start to play different instruments, we start to play different music, what happens is that people outside of the room, and let's say we're all playing different instruments, people outside the room hear the music and go, whoa, whoa, that's beautiful. They enjoy it. Not only do they enjoy it, now they want to, can I join you guys too? And then it brings triangle, casting it, or something like the different instruments. And can I try it? And then everybody plays different. They want to join the orchestra. That's what we call in the, as a church of Jesus Christ, evangelism, right? People, we play, we play together, harmonize, picture him, beautiful tunes of salvation, tunes of redemption, and people in the world hear our music, and they want to join evangelism, and we teach them how to play discipleship, all tuned to the, you know, one music piece, the Bible, and to, to one conductor, Jesus Christ. And tunes of redemption glorifies pictures, beauty, and greatness of our God together. Therefore, our limitation, our uniqueness, but together we can glorify Him, image Him. And that's how He used us. So, uh, why can't do whatever we want? Because we, are, we have conflict and desire, because we, have, we are created beings, limited but purposeful. But thirdly, because it hurts us. 
If we do whatever we want, it, it's going to hurt us. Uh, verse 17 says, For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. What complexifies this argument or this uh, discussion is that it seems like there are multiple, not only one desire, but multiple desires. And these multiple desires can be kind of categorized into two kinds of desires because every, uh, you know, every desire comes from a, a nature and two natures that exist in our hearts if you're a believer. If you're unbeliever, never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and there's no spiritual resurrection took place, you have one nature. That nature says, I want to be God. I want to be exalted. Me, I want it for myself, and that's why we're selfish. But when you trust in Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord, Holy Spirit gives you new birth. And that desire, new desire, new bodies of desires are born, desires to, desires to love. Careful, a genuine love, supernatural love, alien love of Jesus Christ has landed in our hearts, therefore shown in the world. We have two natures. Now, if we do the desires of sinful nature, flesh, according to this passage, flesh, desires of our flesh, is going to destroy us. It's like doing drug. It's like doing abusive drug. It destroy, destroys us. If you follow the desires of a spiritual nature, it's going to build us. Uh, you know, there are things that destroy us, hurt us. There are things that help us, heal us, right? And that's what this Galatians 5, 17 is about. They're opposed to these two kinds of bodies of desire. Two natures are opposed to each other to keep you f- from doing what you want to do. And the, according to the Bible, the perspective is that you are part of the spiritual nature because sinful nature will be gone one day, but you are, essence of who you are is your, is your spiritual nature. So you can't do what you, you want to do. That's why you here is someone who possesses the spiritual nature okay, in our hearts. So when there's comparison between 19 and 22 here, it's comparing the... Uh, our actions and our hearts and our nature of two natures here. Verse 19, it says, Now works of the flesh are evident. So sinful nature called the flesh. And it, it desires and it acts and it, it's described with a, f- wor- a word works. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, different kinds of sins. And then spiritual nature, desires of the spiritual natures are Expressed like this, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. He acts, he does things, but it's described as the, as the word fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace. Actions out of love. Actions out of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. These are all part of the spiritual nature. The question is, why are the desires and actions of the two natures described with these two words? Works and fruit. It says, works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. I think it's because there are several reasons that we talked about when we did the exposition of uh, Galatians. But one thing we want to talk about is because it's because of the source. Source. Because works of the flesh is my heart doing things. I am doing things. So it's works of the flesh is my work. But then why doesn't he say works of the spiritual nature in verse 22, but he says fruit of the Spirit because our spiritual nature is in connection with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is, is speaking or empowering our spiritual nature. And Holy Spirit helps our nature. So whatever good things we do, we do it out of the help of the Holy Spirit. So to, dis- to, so to describe that we are never alone, I know we try to do, live in a right way, but we are, you know, we, we are incapable. But what the passage, what the Bible says, says is that we are never alone. We are always helped by our God in Jesus Christ through the help of the Holy Spirit. There's fruit. So everything we do in our, is because of God, God's help, God's grace, mercy, power that is implanted in us and Everything we do that, are, that is good are the fruit of 
the Holy Spirit. So we can never live independently of God. Apart from me, you can do nothing, he says. So when we do, when we do whatever we want, and often it is of our sinful nature, it hurts us. You eat whatever you want, what happens? It hurts your body. And then let's say, like a, let's say one day you know, you're driving, right? And you go, I don't want to follow these rules. Why do I have to stop at a stop sign? Why can't I go cross the railroad while the train comes? Why the, can't he stop? I'm just going to close my eyes. I'm going to step on the accelerator. I'm going to do whatever I want for an hour. And you can't do that for an hour. <laughs> you can only do that. Maybe two minutes tops. If you're really intuitive, maybe 10 seconds. You're going to hit something. You're either here on this earth or in the hospital or somewhere else. We can't do whatever we want. And if we do, it's going to hurt us. Uh, we are pleasure seekers. We are addictive beings. So when we continuously do those things, slowly it kills us. Because, you know, pl pleasure seeker, we are pleasure seeker means we have nature, we have desires. That means we are seeking pleasure means we are addictive beings. Now, addiction is, you can be, of course, addicted to negative things. We can also be addicted to good things. But we are addictive beings. Because of, but because of the existence of sin nature, bad desires in us, if we do whatever we want, it will lead us to bondage, not necessarily freedom. I know people think, you, when, you, when you do whatever you want, you're free. No, when you do whatever you want, you become uh, in bondage to doing whatever you want. You can't do whatever you need to do. You can't do, oh, I think this is better, but, but this is what I want to do because this is going to give me highest pleasure. You're going to be addicted to those things. Talk to drug addicts, sex addicts, food addicts, emotional attachment addicts, game addicts. They're trapped. Even though they're doing what they want, they're trapped in their addiction. Selfish and self-destroying pleasure. And it's going to limit our choices to less. You cannot live for what is greater than yourself. So then what is Freedom. That means we are able to choose less pleasure sometimes for what builds us, hmm? uh, not what destroys us. Being addicted to the best, eternal, often, often delayed pleasure. Bondages, bondages, choosing pleasure that will ultimately lead us to less pleasure, more pain, ultimate destruction. Freedom is choosing for greater and eternal pleasure. Freedom is being able to say no to sin and yes to spiritual nature. For freedom is different addiction. Saying no to our sinful addiction so that we can say yes to what, what helps us, what builds us. Freedom is choosing Jesus. He becomes our pleasure for his glory. If you're a parent, you understand this. You tell kids, just do things only when you feel like it. It will destroy that kid. How many kids really feel like studying all the time, except few geeky ones? I don't know what you feed them. Right? So that kid, when, but you, you know, parents says, don't do this, you got to study, or don't do this, you got to wash your dishes. Well, he feels like he's in bondage to these rules. But in the big picture, he's being led to freedom. From selfishness to selflessness, addiction to himself. So that he can be a contributing member of the, to the family as well as to the society. Psalm 1 says, if you keep choosing like this, you'll be on the path of righteousness. 1 Corinthians 13 says, if you do this, you are... Becoming a, from imperfect person to a perfect person, you're becoming a child to a man, man and woman of God who's loving. Every choice leads to bondage to destroy us or every choice can lead us to freedom that builds us. I don't know if you saw this old movie <laughs> called Bruce Almighty. 
And as Jim Carrey, in a funny way, really conveys this, you know. Uh, he complains because he's not getting what he wants, so he complains, and one day God appears, Morgan Freeman, and then he comes, <laughs> and then he goes, I am God, and then, you know, and then, and then he says, okay, you complain, you be God. So he becomes God for a while. And then funny scene, there's a funny scene, he comes to a computer and he pushes the computer and says, prayer. <laughs> People are praying to God. So he, oh, how many? And there's a billion prayers just in one town. And then what he does is he's trying to answer and prayer keeps coming. So what he does is he pushes a button, answer yes to all. Boom. And then, you know, it seems like everybody's going to be happy. But what happens is when he goes out, the whole town is in destruction. Think about when everybody gets what they want. Think about what's going to happen. He wants her, she wants him. You know, everybody gets what they want. What's going to happen? If everybody wins a million dollars, what's going to happen? Money is not going to be valuable. Somebody wants someone dead. What's going to happen? When everybody gets what they want. So if you do whatever you want, Not only does it destroy you, it's going to destroy other people, which is the next point. Why can't I do whatever I want? Because we have conflicting desires, we are creative beings, it's going to hurt us. And when it hurts us, it hurts other people. Verse 19, interestingly, it says, Works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality. Works of the flesh, sinful nature. Why does he talk about sexual immorality? And a few verses before this, these laws are about love. Because sex is made, we talked about this many times at CFC, but sex is made so that within the context of marriage, and even in marriage, it's not for your pleasure, though you receive pleasure through sex. It is there to express your love to your spouse. It is the mode of love, loving other people. even sexual desires. But when we have sexual immorality, uh, we use sex for our own pleasure, not giving pleasure to others uh, in your your marriage. So that's why when you're you're in pornography, masturbation, or different kinds of things, sexual immorality, different kinds of sexual immorality, you're just growing in your selfishness. And it's kind of destroying your ability to love, show, express love, love of God to others, especially to your spouse in sexual context. And what happens is that it, because it's destroying you, it destroys your ability to love your spouse, to picture God's love to that person. Of course, marriage context, you know, it shows a picture of the gospel, Christ's love for the church and church's love for Christ. And you have, you have your capability to express that The gospel in a sexual relationship in marriage is destroyed. Therefore, you cannot, you have less capability to love in marriage. And this is all to picture the Trinity. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Relationship of God. God the Son, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're in love with each other. They're just constantly pouring forth love for one another. And that's what we're supposed to picture, picture together. in the body of Christ. Uh, But when we do whatever we want because of the sinful nature, existence of sinful nature in our hearts, it's hurting us. It's hurting our capability to love others and express and image God. So therefore, we are hurting others, uh, hurting others by hurting ourselves. Whole world is like this. That's why in this world, there has to be law, right? Even in this world, secular world, because otherwise we'll we'll destroy one another by seeking for whatever we want. But in the Bible, same thing. There are are laws to guide us so that we can not only, you know, restricting our sins, but also helping us to love, showing us this is how you express your love to one another so that you can be like Jesus who loves others. Through the law, we can become like our God, how, the maximum of how he created us to be. Therefore, we cannot do whatever we want. I, I, I don't know if you knew, but I, I was just in Korea, you know, 
speaking, leading like 20 pastors, and some of our older pastors, were, we, we, we uh, took about 20 pastors to mentor them, to disciple them, and to show Korean churches and you know, learn from their, their Christianity. And I came back, and on the way back, I was... I wasn't really fully upgrade to, you know, you, if you see me in a business class, I'm not paying for it. Church is not paying for it. So, oh, that's how we use our money, huh? You know, don't think like that. I'm always getting free upgrade. Always getting free upgrade if I get upgrade. This time I got like half upgrade. I was sitting there still thankful, bitter that I, I didn't get a little <laughs> further, you know, but I was there still pretty comfortable. And, and then there was this lady who was sitting beside me and then... Uh, I realized she was very friendly with other flight attendants. And I realized she was a flight attendant, and there was a free seat. So they gave this you know, flight attendant, who's not working in that airplane, I mean, but she's probably coming back from somewhere, sitting there. And they were so friendly to each other. So this another flight attendant knew she was flight attendant. So they were giving chips and sandwiches I wasn't getting like they were like giving to her and I realized wow they're friendly to each other and then I realized that she had her fiance in the back so they were walking in and they, they go oh there's seat seat in this premium economy open do you want to sit there and then I guess she sent him back and then she sat there you know and then uh, you know I realized wow I, I almost felt like crying I wanted to give that seat to that guy so that the two people can sit together but I didn't Because I had to prepare this message, you know, what we're doing there. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> But then I realized on top of that, there's another guy who was talking to her and realized they are like third grade classmates. So what he does is he's like, like bringing more chips. In fact, a couple minutes later, he brought a bag of, literally, I mean it, like this big bag of chips to her and she didn't know what to do with all this food. I want to say, can I have some? <laughs> And they were so caring for each other throughout like 14-hour trip. Almost made me feel, I was so blessed watching that. And I almost felt like I wanted to be a flight attendant, <laughs> being part of their community. And how, you know, the Bible says in John, if we love one another, they will see Christ through us. They will know we are his disciples. How we need to love one another. And by our love, They will see him. Together we receive more. Together we give, it, give more. Together we are more. Philip Yancey said this, I left the church because I found so little grace there. But he said, but I came back because it's the only place I found any Not pray. It says CFC will be filled with his grace. Not just a glimpse of grace, but full of grace. So when people walk in, that they want to join. Tunes of redemption. Songs of salvation. Opus of his glory. Let's go to the fifth thing. Why can't we? I do whatever I want because we are, confl we are conflicted. These eyes were created beings. It hurts us. It's going to hurt other people. But fifthly, because there is eternal consequence. Envy, drunkenness, orgies. 21 verse 21. And things like these I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, it doesn't, of course, it doesn't mean if you do this, You're not, you can't go to heaven or you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If you do this without Christ, then you end up, your life end up without Christ. Some of us are asking, isn't that too much? Eternal judgment, people going to hell, isn't that too much? But if we examine our own hearts, we have similar desires in our hearts. We can understand this. If you watch the news, if you watch on TV, and you see the worst criminal. How do you feel? Somebody says, let's forgive them. Okay, maybe if we really repent, if he really, you know, takes on, maybe. But some of us will say, I still don't want him to be forgiven. 
There are some people that in our lives, we really don't want to forgive that person. What, what we are saying is we want judgment on that person for eternity. On top of that, if that person is not repentant and in fact laughs at you, he abused you, hurt you, took away your money or whatever, and then he laughs at you every time you say, are you repentant about that? Can you apologize? He laughs at you. What we want is we want pain will be as great as the pain that caused us or pain that caused in other people. And we kind of want their pain to be as great as their pleasure because there's pleasure in sin. And that's what eternal judgment is apart from Christ. Uh, Sinners have caused pain. And so many others, but towards God, infinitely, eternally. And and their pain will be as great as their pleasure. You know, pain in uh, eternal destruction, eternal hell is like, you know, ball of your heart grows. Whatever you want, you desire. Our our desire keeps growing. So uh, that desire will be carried over to hell. So Drug addicts will be drug addicts, but no drug. Uh, Whatever you desire, you keep that desire, right? And that desire, whatever you've done, whatever you've done, whatever your desire that you increase will be the pain apart from Christ. And uh, only in Jesus Christ that, you know, we can be forgiven. Because he takes that eternal destruction and judgment on on the cross. So when we say judgment, there are two aspects of judgments, right? Location and the degree of pleasure or pain. Location, either heaven or hell. Location depends on your faith in Jesus Christ. But degree of pleasure or pain depends on your love for Jesus Christ on on this earth. However, our hearts are like bowls, right? We talked about this in the last message that I preached about why, why do I need to live for God? Whatever you sin, your bow grows. Whatever, uh, whenever we live for God, our bow grows. Heaven will be, sin nature will be gone, and heaven will be how much we love Christ. So there's degree of reward difference in heaven. And God's going to pour his pleasure on us and how much we can handle. He wants to give us more, but it's how much we can receive. And that Capacity is determined on how we live on this earth for Christ. It's how much of uh, uh, love for Christ grows in this world. And there's that judgment coming. Everything will be evaluated. Therefore, that's why we cannot do whatever we want. I show this paper, toilet paper. Hey. Oh, sorry. Every time I bend, there's some kind of pain in my body now. This is important because this is not, you know, everything about life. This is this life. This is important because it because, depends on how you live, what you choose, how you choose to live. Life goes on and on and on and on and on. Again and again. <laughs> more and more, you know. Forever and ever. All depends on this. So this life is important. What you choose now is important, but how you live this world is important. Therefore, sometimes you need to deny less pleasure, sinful pleasure, pleasure that will destroy you, to choose pleasure that will, will be infinite, eternal, your maximum pleasure, and for his glory. We're going to see this video, two adjacent video clips, and if you're an old person in the church, you have showed this in the past. One of my favorite clips, movie clips is from the movie Ray. Basically, it's about a blind African-American singer named Ray Charles. Uh, it's about his life, and it's about how his mom trains him when he's about to go blind. 
Uh, and the uh, first scene is when he's about to go blind, and second scene, uh, all together about three minutes, very short video, but second scene is about uh, how she is patient so that uh, she can uh, have Ray grow. Okay? Let's watch this clip. Around the bush with you. You going blind. The doctor saying nothing they can do, so we gotta do it ourselves. Yes, um, I know, but... Stop it. Stop it right now. We ain't got no time for no tears. Ain't nobody gonna have no pity on you just cause you going blind. Now wipe them eyes. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll show you how to do something once. I'll help you if you mess up twice. But the third time, you're on your own. Cause that's the way it is in the world. All right, now get up. Remember, you going blind, but you ain't stupid. <coughs> Remember how many stairs there were? Four. Good. You're going to have to learn how to use your memory. Now turn around, and I want you to hold out your hands and use them as your eyes and find a door. Good. That's real good, baby. I hear you too, Mama. You're right there. <laughs> yeah, yes, I am. Why are you crying, Mama? Because I'm happy. When I see this scene, when the Child falls down. Mama, I need your help. And any parent would understand your heart moves and you would want to go. But she stays. She had the conflicting desire at that moment. But he cho she chooses the greater desire, what is best for the child. Oh, God is like that. God has conflicting desires all over the places, all the time. When we are in need of help, God has conflicting desires, but he has to choose what is best for you. Don't judge him in a simple way. We're too simplistic. You're thinking about three things. He's thinking about a billion other things. He's just, just you. He's thinking about thousands of things for you, for your 10 years later, 15 years later, for your eternity. 
It seems that God's ultimate desire, though, is your eternal happiness and eternal and His eternal glory. You realize God gives just enough and takes away just enough for our good and for His glory. You realize God says enough yeses, but also knows of our requests and prayers for our best and for His glory. The conflicting desires of God are ultimately shown on the cross when we deserve wrath, but He also wants to save us, so He pours His wrath on His own Son so that we can receive eternal love. The conflicting desires of God is solved on the cross through Jesus Christ so that we can have eternal love so that everything he does, as he restrains himself to help us to save us now at times, so that we can grow, so we can glow for his glory and for our eternal happiness and joy and for his eternal glory. So this ought to be our, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, life, life principles. If you want to come and follow me, you want, you want eternal happiness, eternal joy, eternal pleasure in this life. Deny yourself. Deny your selfish pleasure. I want to do whatever I want. You need to deny that because it's going to destroy you. Take up his cross daily. It's going to help you. It's going to build you. And follow me. Your life will be filled with displaying of his glory, seeing his glory and showing of his glory. Because of that, that's why you can't do whatever you want. Because you have conflicting desires, but choose the desires related to Christ. And you are created limited, but in your limitedness, if you obey, together we can picture him. Then it's going to help us, not hurt us. It's going to help others. And it's going to lead to eternal glory and our eternal pleasure. Let's pray.